When you think of some of the best weapons in shooters, what do you think of? Perhaps the BFG from Doom, that's a pretty cool weapon. Perhaps the rocket launcher from Quake, that's a staple, solid choice. The smart pistol from Titanfall 2, if, you know, you happen to occasionally partake in huffing glue. Dual 1887s from Modern Warfare 2, anybody? What do you mean that was for assholes? But what if I were to tell you that some of the best weapon design in FPS games actually came from something that many people consider to be just a silly party game? That's right, we're talking about TF2, a game that has for the last five years been solely developed by a stray dog. It's a game that almost everybody has in their Steam library, and a game that you yourself have probably played. But you're probably saying to me, YouTube guy that I don't know, is it possible for a game that's more of a social conga line simulator and an economic Ponzi scheme to actually have good game design? It's very possible. TF2's weapon design is some of the most experimental, some of the most expressive and practical weapon design I think I've seen in any FPS game for quite a while. To call it experimental is an understatement. And one of the things I liked the most about TF2's weapon design was its ability to embrace itself as a game and embrace the freedom that is inherent to many Source Engine games and that is inherent to TF2 as a whole. There are effectively five major things that TF2 weapons do to the game that improve it. Firstly, they sometimes can radically change the playstyle of different classes, so that if you don't happen to like the particular way that a class plays, you can change it to a variety, a wide spectrum, if you will, of different kinds of playstyles, ranging from things that aren't really that different to things that are almost an entirely new character. Secondly, they often provide new, exciting abilities to characters who didn't have them before, sometimes radically changing what a character is capable of. Third, they give you the ability to customize the amount of execution you're trying to put up with, ranging from making certain classes easier to play for people who are a bit less precise on the whole aiming part, to rewarding players who have more precision and have trained themselves, allowing for a wide variety of skill levels to find a niche within the arsenal that they enjoy. And four, they also allow the matchups of the game to be drastically changed by the addition of new weapons, something that a lot of other character-based FPS games and other character-based games in general just simply don't let you do. Now you might be saying, YouTube guy, who cares? I know you've talked a lot about what you can do with this game and what this game does that's so great, but why is any of that good? And additionally, when can I go home? And first off, you're right, let's start talking about why these things are good. And second off, you can leave after you've subscribed, of course. I will simply just need you to click the button, that is all. It's just a little button, it cannot hurt. But Don't you want to click, click it, it's red. Do it. So, let's talk about our first topic, the ability for the player to create drastically different characters out of existing ones just by changing their loadout. The first good thing about this is that the implication that you can do this at all means that TF2 was willing to experiment with its gameplay and push itself. But this wasn't just hypothetical, TF2 took advantage of this implication. Most of the weapons in Team Fortress 2 are impactful and unique, and either have a different playstyle or different use cases than the stock option. Which is good because you can have all of the experimental design you want, but it doesn't matter if you don't actually make it tangible, which Team Fortress 2 succeeded in doing. Secondly, this is good because, due to the loadout system, you can now combine any number of different weapons or abilities that a character has and create a vast number of new loadouts or playstyles from them. This makes all of the interactions and the matchups in the game more interesting and deeper, because there's now so many different ways that you can tackle a situation, and so many parts of a playstyle that you can reward yourself for, and so many new playstyles that you can even make. If you're playing Soldier and you find yourself just taking too much damage, you can start taking something like the Black Box, or start using the Conjurer, which communicates to all of your enemies that not only are you lacking in certain things, such as a 4 rocket magazine or a shotgun, but also that you're going to be more sustainable than a typical Soldier would. And obviously this goes for any number of different combinations of weapons. You can create all kinds of stuff in this game, just by slotting in and out different weapons with other ones. And because this game was willing to experiment as much as it was, all of these weapons end up being very interesting, and therefore the combinations they create become more unique as a result. Alternate weapons in this game aren't just minor stat changes. Some of them are, but most of the time they're actually something that's really unique. So alternative playstyles in this game have a really strong identity outside of their initial character. 
It isn't just a little bit different, and when weapons are so experimental, they're also just more expressive and they interact in more interesting ways. There's very few weapons in Team Fortress 2 that don't feel like they should exist. Everything has either a different use case or a drastically different method of playing the game, or rewards a legitimate enough part of playing the character to feel like it should be there. And that's part of why the experimentation is so good. When you're willing to experiment, you push the boundaries of what's possible with your characters, and you create more room for niches to be filled. For example, let's talk about probably the greatest case of a class basically being created in TF2 out of the items, and that is Demonite. Demonite is probably the most extreme shift from the initial character to a new subclass that exists in the game. Demo Man's main strength is that he is very good at controlling space. Demo Man can saturate wide areas with a lot of damage, and he can hold down vast parts of the map with his sticky bombs. So if you were making an alternative weapon for this character, the first thing you should probably do is obviously take away his ability to do so and then give him a really sharp stick. And that's pretty much what Demo Knight does. It turns a character that is normally used for space control or who can do a lot of damage to a lot of enemies all at once to being able to hit one person with one sword. But he hits those people really hard. And Demo Knight also benefits from the fact that it's just cool. And this is cool because it allows you not only just to play a character in a different way because of your preferences, but also because of the loadout system, you can customize your characters and mix and match the different abilities you want them to have. Meaning that you don't need to play just Demo Knight or Demo Man, but you can make like a hybrid between them. And obviously the same goes for every subclass and every class in the entire game. And this not only makes the game better just from a preferential standpoint, or just because you think one is more fun, it makes it deeper because there's many different ways that you can tackle any situation. And their willingness to experiment and their willingness to add interesting designs to their game, and sometimes very extreme designs to their game, makes all of this so much better. Valve really meant it when they said, I swear to God, if you complain about TF2 one more time, I'll nerf the ambassador again. Which I think really gives a lot of insight into the development team's design ethos when it came to the weapons of Team Fortress 2. When it comes to game design, I'm personally of the belief that if you're not going to go hard, you should just go home. This is kind of my problem with FPS game design for the last, like, a long time is that weapons within the arsenals of these games are more so defined by minor statistical changes rather than sweeping design alterations. And I think that the latter is more fun than the former. Here's the thing about TF2's weapon design, and about weapon design similar to TF2 across all games, is that Team Fortress 2 made it so that every weapon has a strong argument for being there. Not every weapon's argument is as strong as every other weapon's, but I would argue that for most of the arsenal, there's a strong argument that that weapon deserves to be in the game. And the reason for that is again because each one either has a specific use case where it's the best option, or because it has just an interesting design. When your weapons don't strive to do that, you end up with a giant pool of weapons that all kinda just feel like they're doing the same thing, or more so just feel like they don't necessarily deserve to be in the game. There are many games where the differences are just, oh well this one's more accurate, or this one fires a bit faster, or this one has more magazine capacity. Whereas with TF2, there are very unique identities to each weapon. Like, for example, the Force of Nature and the Soda Popper. Two weapons that are in the same slot, on the same class, and are quite similar, but are different in substantial ways. Probably to the point where I don't even really need to explain it. And our next topic is one of the reasons why. The second topic that we're going to talk about is the fact that TF2's weapons often give the characters new abilities, and these new abilities can be pretty important. I mean, just for an example that we're familiar with, the shields give the demo man the ability to charge at all, and they also let him do something called shrimping. And if you don't know what shrimping is, don't worry, neither do I, but it's effectively, uh, hoverboarding? It's effectively source engine wizardry, really, that allows you to not actually make contact with the ground and therefore glide off of inclined surfaces, therefore letting you become an eagle. And obviously the best thing to do with this immense power is therefore to go for the medic, kill him, die, and scream med down. And this is but one of the many different powers that weapons can afford characters in this game. Multiple characters get really significant movement capabilities from different weapons, such as the Quick Fix, the Wrangler, or the Detonator, allowing Pyros to jump around the map so they can get behind your team more easily or get into important places, 
letting soldiers and demo men do their typical movement but without the risk of taking any damage, giving scouts a third jump, or again, allowing engineers to jump to incredibly cryptic and sort of novelty sentry locations. But they aren't only just movement abilities. For example, the banners give the soldier the ability to go from one of the more versatile killers in the game to a class that can legitimately break stalemates, in a game where breaking stalemates is pretty much the medic's job. The heavy sandwich gives him the ability to sustain himself and more importantly his medic, making him one of the few semi-reliable sources of healing in the entire game. And the gunslinger gives the engineer the ability to make every enemy scout groan whenever they see him. Really powerful stuff, and again stuff that was willing to break the mold of the game and stuff that's a complete departure from the original weapon in these slots. It's the willingness to experiment, and then the willingness to actually take advantage of their imagination, that kind of punctuates the weapon design in this game. Very few games are willing, honestly, to just allow a character to fly around the map like a jet plane, but games are also a lot cooler when you allow things to happen, when you add powerful effects and just let players go nuts with them and TF2 was very willing to give players the freedom to play around with impactful abilities. And the game, and games in general, are better for it. They're more interesting with stuff like bee hopping or trimping, or Aegis Reflector, or whatever, than they are with just minor differences between all of your different choices. But this isn't all that TF2 did to make its weapons interesting and well-designed. TF2 not only changed how certain classes played, it also changed how you play them. And I don't just mean in the form of what your rewards are, but also in the form of how difficult a character is to actually play. For example, the Sydney Sleeper. Let's briefly talk about Sniper. Sniper is pretty much the de facto pick class, maybe aside from Spy. Sniper's job, and really his only job, is to take threatening or important enemy classes and kill them. He does so by being able to shoot lethal headshots to pretty much any character, even overhealed heavies, across the entire map. If you need to get rid of a medic, or a heavy, or a problem sentry gun, or something like that, Sniper's the guy you call. But what if someone isn't really that good or that consistent at hitting headshots? Can you still be effective on Sniper? And yes, you can, especially so if you have the Sydney Sleeper. The Sydney Sleeper reduces your damage on headshots, you still get more rewards, so it trains you to actually want to do them still, but while you're in that learning process, it gives you other rewards, while still maintaining the sniper's general game plan. You're still shooting scoped-in shots at people from long distances, but now your scoped-in shots apply Jurati, which if you don't know what that is, how? But if you don't, it's basically a debuff that is applied to enemies that makes it so they take more damage from all sources. So in a weird way, you're still a pick class, you're still getting rid of problem enemies, you're just doing so in a more cooperative way. You're not taking care of them just yourself, though you kinda can. You're hitting them with something that makes them easier to get rid of, assuming you have an ally who's paying attention or is fighting them, and can clean them up with their new added damage. Now of course, in a pub server, this is difficult to coordinate, but still, it allows you to function as a sniper without necessarily being the best from a precision standpoint. You can still be functional and impactful and lethal, without being, you know, a super, super gamer. gamer. But I think TF2 still does this in a more interesting fashion than many of its contemporaries. In a lot of other games, if you're shooting a gun that's less precise but also less rewarding, it's usually just something like, oh, it does less overall damage, but you don't have to be as good at shooting to use it. TF2's solutions usually end up with something far more interesting. Like, for example, the backburner is easier to use overall than the regular flamethrower. You're not rewarded as much for air blasting, though you do still have the option, and sometimes you just get behind somebody or they turn around on you and you kill them because you do a ton of damage. But it's not just that it's less rewarding and easier to use, it's more so that it rewards a different kind of play than what quote-unquote good pyros are typically doing. Typically... Yep. Instead of just being worse, it rewards you for getting behind your opponents or getting them to run away from you, which changes how you play the game. Sure, the backburner can lead to some cheap and easy kills, that's kind of why it's there. But the backburner also rewards different kinds of play than just doing what another weapon does, but kind of worse. Which is how a lot of games balance their weapons. And that's kind of everything with this game, it's all trying to do something interesting. 
And this leads us into our next topic quite well, and that's just that, much like many other games, Team Fortress 2 allows you to reward certain parts of your playstyle by choosing different weapons. And I will admit, this is the least exciting, least unique part of the video. A lot of games do this. In fact, most FPS games do this, assuming they have two weapons, and that those weapons do different things. But I still think that Team Fortress 2 does this in a way that's typically more interesting than other games. Not in every case, but in many of them. For example, I love using the airstrike, not because I'm, er, uh, not because it's good, or for its rapid fire when you're rocket jumping thing, but mostly just because I don't like reloading, and the airstrike makes it so that you don't have to do as much of that when it matters. But the thing about TF2 is that. Sure, it has weapons that are just minor statistical changes in certain cases, but even within these weapons, they also sometimes have these cool extra abilities, like the airstrike's ability to do the rapid fire when you're rocket jumping thing it does. Or these stats are changed in such a way that it changes the way you play with the weapon. And again, I simply find it interesting and valuable that Valve felt the need, at least to some degree, to make it so every weapon felt like it belonged. To make each weapon feel like it has an identity and that it should be here, for some reason or another, rather than taking an existing weapon and then just modifying its stats and giving it a bunch of different models. If TF2 has a shotgun, it has a shotgun for a reason. And this isn't a new thing, it is the thing. This is how FPS games were initially designed. The arsenals of Doom and Quake, Unreal Tournament, games like this, had the same kind of philosophy, partially because in these earlier days of gaming, you really just couldn't afford to have 500 guns in your game or whatever. But nowadays, every game has just like a sea of assault rifles, just like 50 copies of each classification of weapon, which all kind of play the same. Like yes, there are minor differences, but when you're actually in a fight, those differences don't matter. And those differences don't really combine in such a way that it makes anything interesting, which is where TF2 succeeds. And the final thing that Team Fortress 2's weapons do very well is that they were willing to make sweeping changes to many of the game's matchups. Games can be very touchy about changing their matchups, especially games with as curated of an ecosystem as Team Fortress 2. Team Fortress 2 was designed with certain interactions in mind. Spies are pretty good against Engineer, Pyro is pretty good against Spy, Sniper is pretty good against Pyro. TF2 had a lot of interactions that were designed to work a specific way. That was the plan, and you were not supposed to disrupt the plan. And then Valve disrupted the plan. And it's a good thing they did, because the original plan was kinda boring. And because there are a lot of matchups and a lot of characters in this game that are really boring without the additional weapons. For example, when is the last time your friend walked up to you and said, Hey, you wanna play some of that stock spy? Fucking never, that's when. Because vanilla spy is pretty bad and pretty boring. But once you start adding some of these additional weapons, then you start having a different conversation. For example, the engineer. The engineer has a lot of problematic matchups. He's not very great versus demo men, he struggles a little bit versus soldiers, he really hates snipers, and by design, he's kind of weak to spies. So, life can be tough for the Engineer, until you equip the Wrangler. Now, despite the fact that the Wrangler is probably some of the biggest horseshit in the entire game, the Wrangler is actually, in my opinion, one of the best designed weapons in the entire arsenal. The Wrangler gives the Engineer incredible new abilities, changes the way he can play the game, and makes a lot of his bad matchups a lot less bad. The Wrangler allows the Engineer to take his normally automated sentry gun and control it manually. Which means, when before, snipers and soldiers could just outrange the sentry gun and shoot it from beyond its effective range where it couldn't defend itself, the engineer can now actually threaten these enemies. Whereas before, the demo man could just lob damage at a sentry gun from behind a piece of cover where the sentry gun could not see them and therefore could not defend itself, the engineer can now at least try to fire some rockets behind that cover, therefore pestering the demo man and getting them to leave their position. Or at the very least, if the engineer sees a demo man coming up and trying to get to that position, you can preemptively kill them from a long range. And the same basically goes for spies. The Wrangler allows you to preemptively kill disguised or even cloaked spies, adding to your ability to defend your nest. And this is all in addition to allowing the engineer to do cool stuff like sentry jumping. And the Wrangler actually brings up another good point, which is the major and probably only failing of the TF2 arsenal, and that would be balance. If there's one thing TF2's arsenal isn't very good at in certain cases, though in unfortunately very extreme cases, it's balance. 
There are certain weapons that even in a casual environment, which is uncoordinated and just has all manner of different people trying all manner of stupid stuff, certain weapons are kind of just better than many other alternatives. Such as the Wrangler. But of course, the Wrangler isn't the only weapon that's really strong for its class. Jirati is another example of a weapon that is kind of just better than the SMG. The Sandwich is much stronger than any of Heavy's shotgun options. And as you get more competitive and teams start to get more coordinated, the balance becomes even more stringent, and more and more weapons start to become bannable. But even for the best players in the game, there are a substantial number of weapons that aren't banned. In fact, most of them aren't. According to the community, there are 700 gazillion conceptual weapons possible in Team Fortress 2, with hundreds of absolutely miserably designed examples being made every single day on the Reddit. And 160 of these are actually real. And of those 160, only 26 of them have been banned from 6v6, which is kind of the highest skill, most optimal competitive format. Though there might be some Highlander players or 4v4 players who disagree. <laughs> 4v4. No, but seriously, the balance is not that bad. It's not that good, but it's not that bad. The main problem with TF2's balance is that some of these stock weapons are not particularly good in comparison to alternatives, even though all of the TF2 weapons are supposed to be side grades to the default, leading to certain ones kind of just being the leader of the pack among their slot. Secondly, that many weapons are balanced only because they don't have random critical hits, which, if you play on any self-respecting server, doesn't happen anyway. And third, certain weapons are just too easy to get really great rewards out of. The Mad Milk and the Jurati, in particular, have really impactful rewards for the cost of you can miss it. And I don't know if you happen to have ever played a first-person shooter, but missing happens to be the weakness to all of the guns ever. Or at least... Most of them. I, I just want to know why I respond. I just want to know why. And the thing is, is that this isn't unfixable. Rebalancing the game is not outside of Valve's capabilities. It's just outside of their interest. Because lowering the recharge rate of Mad Milk or whatever doesn't make money just appear in your lap. And it doesn't sell any Steam Decks either, so they're just probably not going to do it. But regardless of what Valve does, what they have done so far has been really cool, in my opinion. It would be nice to see Team Fortress get another update, because the community for this game is so passionate, so talented, I would say more so than a lot of other communities, probably because of SFM. So often very polite and welcoming and in the closet, and so rightfully jaded about the way Valve has treated this game. It's just a shame that a product, even just from a business standpoint, that could make probably a significant financial return is just being ignored for the most part. It's it's being updated enough that they're willing to put in cosmetics that Valve obviously makes a lot of money from, even though Valve does basically none of the work. But when you ask for new weapons or new maps and maybe a trailer to go along with it, you know, you can go fuck yourself apparently. It's just such a shame that Valve doesn't seem to think that Team Fortress 2 is as fun as everybody else does. And I hope maybe that Valve would be willing to at least slightly adjust their priorities towards this incredibly beautiful example of game design. That being said, thank you all so much for watching. I know that whenever someone subscribes or likes or really does anything with a YouTube video or a channel, that you're doing me a service. So I hope that this video was up to your standards to maybe earn your respect in that manner. I will see you all next time when I make another video. It probably won't be TF2 related, but it might be. But I don't know. Thank you so much, and I'll see you again.